Cyberpunk 2077, a video game spawned from the tabletop game Cyberpunk 2020, a controversial release, and now a new DLC on the way called Phantom Liberty. Why care about it? It's been two years since it dropped, but it still has a very dedicated fan base. And fighting over its launch is about as repetitive now as being angry that No Man's Sky didn't launch with multiplayer. We've all seen it. But we've also seen Cyberpunk Edgerunners bring even more eyes to the game, and now people want to dip their toes into the universe after really getting a taste of how deep it can go. 2077 has just as much depth hidden in it itself, going back to its roots if you know where to look. Most do know the Cyberpunk 2020 tabletop game was the source for 2077, but the newest version of that rule set, called Cyberpunk Red, adds even more to the mix. Same timeline, same city. And what is Red? Well, Red is technically the prequel to 2077. Not a lot of people seem to know that, and I've noticed that on my channel and in the comments, so making sure to define that right off the bat before we really get started. Because I really am about to go into why people who are either fans of Cyberpunk for the tabletop game, or the video game, or hell, even the anime should care about the other side of the fence. Because, well, it is all about to become one singular experience, in a way. I promised news about Cyberpunk Edge Runners when I talked about this video before in streams, and I'm not going to waste time in sharing it either. I had to make sure I could talk about this, by the way. Remember back in November, when I shared that Cyberpunk Edge Runners was coming to Cyberpunk Red? Well, it is, and it's on track for its playtesting at Gen Con 2023. So, yes, at Gen Con 2023 is the playtest for the Cyberpunk Edge Runners mission kit, the first taste of the Cyberpunk 2077 rules for Cyberpunk Red. And, well, it's lined up to be a pre-made adventure called The Jacket. The Jacket takes place after the events at Arisaka Tower, and that's its description following each sitting. It is going to be happening right after what goes down at the end of Edge Runners. Do not treat this as confirmation that The Jacket is going to be the final adventure released with the mission kit. This is just the playtesting adventure, but it is confirmed we are going to get to explore what happened after everything goes down in Edge Runners, at least for the playtest. When people coming from 2077 learn about Cyberpunk Red, they are usually coming into Red wanting to continue their own story from 2077, play their own version of V, or just really play in the same world. Until now, you can only really homebrew that. But once that mission kit is released, they'll be able to do that at least partially until the full bore Cyberpunk 2077 supplement is released for Red. This means knowing what bridges the link between 2045, the time of the Red, and 2077, the City of Dreams. And well, for a GM, that's going to be a godsend to know at least a bit ahead of time. There's more links than you think to the time of the Red that are in Cyberpunk 2077, and I'll even show you some here in the next part of this video. But if you came for the Edge Runner news, there you have it. No waiting to the end and no me holding it off. The playtest is going to be kicking off at Gen Con 2023, like I said, for attendees. Just check the site, it's all public there. And yes, I am going to be GMing games there if I can afford to do the trip. This is a short notice choice of mine to go, but I intend to be there in person if everything works right. Now, to say it quick too, you're going to notice two maps that I'm going to be using in the rest of this video for locations. Even the shape of the landscape of Night City has changed due to rebuilding, dredging, and really pushing buildings off into the sea. Locations are not going to be 100% exact, and some have even moved between 2045 and 2077 to new parts of the city. But what I'm going to be showing you here for the most part is 2045 locations that are still in 2077. Some are actually dead on the spot on the map of 2045. And I'll go over one of those first just to really give you an idea of how far this goes. When it comes to lining up locations and lore in 2077 from 2045, the one I always use as an example to my friends is NCPD Precinct No. 1, located right here in the Glen. It is one spot that has not been moved at all in 2077, and serves as a great location to just give a hint that the universe is a connected one. Thanks to this precinct too, I can let you all peek into a former combat zone. Yeah, that's one thing to note about Phantom Liberty and the use of combat zone being thrown around so much. It does not mean one singular closed-in spot, or at least it hasn't until now. Because right now, where we are, was a 2045 combat zone. The whole area to the east of the precinct, almost right where El Coyote Coyo is, used to be a combat zone that was kind of U-shaped, taking up most of the southern dip of the island. Essentially, any area that is lawless and ran by the gangs themselves can be considered a combat zone. And yup, that does mean Pacifica and potentially Dogtown once we get a look at it. I get the feeling that Dogtown, though, got the Detroit treatment. 
The Afterlife is hands down the most famous and well-known club to come out of 2077. If you've played 2077 at all, you know the Afterlife, how to get in, who runs it, and the cost of getting a drink named after you. Split into three different areas, which are the Antechamber, the Crypt, and Hades, the bar really leans into the mortuary roots that it has. The Afterlife in 2045 is, of course, though, in a slightly different location. It was located in this area, northeast of city center. The purpose for the move can just be chalked up to ease of story, but also for the fact that at this time, the entire area was undergoing massive rebuilding after, you know, the nuke that happened. Now we also get to see Club Atlantis in its glory in 2077 due to a flashback with Johnny. While its real game location is here in Japantown, right behind these grates, the 2045 location of the Atlantis is actually located south of the city center. The Atlantis by far gives that pre-afterlife vibe, it being the club of choice for mercs back in 2045 on where to go for the good gigs. But like all things with time, and you know, not to mention nukes, the club saw an eventual downfall and fell into ruin that paved the way for the afterlife to take center stage. But now let's talk about two other bars that you might not know about. One bar that is used heavily in Cyberpunk 2020 in red, but it's absent entirely from 2077, is called the Forlorn Hope. Thing is though, that was not always the plan. Claire Russell was going to have something to do with the Forlorn Hope and the bar would have appeared in the game, according to game files that have been uncovered. It was founded by John and Marianne Freeman, aiming to be a home for veterans from the Central America War. Thing about it is, over time, it became a major hangout for solos and mercs, and, with the permission of the Freemans, even Rogue would use the Forlorn Hope as a place to scout potentials for the afterlife. In terms of its location, though, it would have been right around here, going off the map from 2045. Another bar absent in 2077, but a personal favorite of mine to use in Cyberpunk Red, is Short Circuit. My own players frequent the spot, which is a tech and netrunner bar by description. It's ran and owned by Three Piece and Brain, and their adopted daughter Bug. In 2045, Short Circuit was directly west of the corporate center, and also the crater left by the nuke. When checking the area here in 2077, you're going to find something interesting that's a little coincidental. Seventh Hell. Almost in the exact spot where Short Circuit would be, we have an entirely different club, with multiple stories and quite a bit of tech inside too. I'm not going to claim that this could have initially been Short Circuit, but it's a fun coincidence having this bar right here near where Short Circuit would be. Let's get to some more known stuff though. Trauma Team Tower. The tower has a security rating of 3 according to the NCPD, meaning top of the line, highly sophisticated defenses, this thing is a fortress. Due to their own efficiency, and also due to medical science and technology, they actually have a scale of dead called Death State. If someone is listed as dead one, they're just flatlined and can be resuscitated pretty much easily. But then though, you can go all the way up to dead 10, which means there is zero chance of recovery. This scale slides up once every minute and is affected by multiple factors like what may be used on site, the condition of the body, what drugs may be on hand, a lot of different things. The tower itself is almost in the exact same location as it is listed on the 2045 map, so whenever it came to the restructuring of Night City, there was not a lot going on on the north side of things, and pretty much it's very hard to miss if you're looking for it. It really stands out with that big symbol on the side of it. One spot that's very well known in Cyberpunk Red, but has no mention in 2077, is the Danger Gal headquarters. Tucked into the northwest area of downtown, you'll know this spot if you frequent the Ripper Dock here. Funny thing though, that despite a real lack of location in the game, there's this really striking skyscraper tucked right here into the corner. Danger Gal was ran by Michiko Arasaka, and I can't shake the Arasaka vibe to this building. Now back then, Michiko was very against her family's corporation, building a detective agency that kept extensive dossiers and information on many people in the city. Small detective, big gun was the motto. And for us who play Cyberpunk Red, we're actually getting the Danger Gal dossier as our next book too, full of NPCs. It's a little fun to think that this structure could have housed that whole endeavor. It just, hmm, just fits the vibe. Let's head down to the south side of Ninth City though for a couple little things I'd like to show you too. Pacifica itself is an example of how much things can go wrong in only about 30 years. Initially, this was a corporate zone, a playground for the rich as Placide does explain. Now, in Cyberpunk 2077, Pacifica itself is the best explanation and example of a combat zone. You even see NCPD flee the area, leaving control to the people themselves and the gangs fighting for control in it. And sure enough, I'm taking you down to Playland by the Sea. 
right where it's supposed to be, the theme park itself is in shambles and attached to the GIM, and usually home to a gang or two. Fun thing though is the coaster is still rideable, just uh, yeah, don't get yourself killed on it. I'm gonna take you now a little northeast to Rancho Coronado, and just to show you something that is the remnants of what was in 2045. Back then, Rancho Coronado was described as the ultimate Beaverville. You know, think about those cute little suburbs with white picket fences. Fun thing about it now is in 2077, you can actually see the leftovers of that era. The layout of the homes, the strip malls, and even cul-de-sacs like Grove Street still have a taste of that time. So to bring it all around, why am I showing you all of this? Why care about Cyberpunk 2077 if you're a Cyberpunk Red player? Well, the answer is because, thanks to 2077, you now have the easiest way to visualize Night City itself if you're new. You can actually feel the vibe of each street, see the wildness of the design, and pull anything you may need for your own games. For new players, sometimes something tangible really helps them get into the game. I've always recommended newer players to Red who have 2077 to make their characters in 2077's creator, so they can have a little fun actually visualizing them. It's a different feeling to make your own character rather than pull up an image online that resembles them. You can do this too as a GM, thanks to literally people walking down the street to create tokens and images and NPCs from. Add in some cosmetic mods, and you've got a resource gold mine. This is all going to be even better in the end for players and GMs both when the mission kit comes out after all, since it'll contain the quick hack rules and other neat little things about Night City that we've been waiting to know. With 2077 being a gateway into Cyberpunk Red for so many new players and eyes, throwing it out the window is just a mistake in my opinion. Cyberpunk Red has a ton of great stories to tell in 2045. Don't throw that setting away for 2077 completely either. It really is all one long sweeping storyline that you can pick your place in taking part in, and can be the character you actually want to be in it. 2077 is what got me into Cyberpunk Red after all. I'm one of those new faces to give it a try thanks to the video game. I really do hope that sharing locations like these really helps you get an idea that you should look in on the other side of the fence if you're hesitant. If you're playing the video game, know you've got a whole nother medium to try for continuing to play, and, well, to be fair, anyone who bought Cyberpunk 2077 already owns a previous rule set core book. Check your bonus content folder, you already own Cyberpunk 2020. And if you're playing the tabletop game, know you've got a massive resource in the video game because you have so much you can pull from and visualize, from street vibes to maps, layouts, characters. Yeah, there really is a lot. For me though, that's it for this video. As I said earlier, I do plan to get to Gen Con this year. It was a last minute call back at the end of April to do this though. If I do manage to pull the trip off, I will be there GMing for our Talsorian Games, the maker of Cyberpunk Red. I won't give exact times yet though, because I need to pull the trip off after all. At some urging from people smarter than I am, I did open the Patreon up, link in the description, and it'll be what funds the trip. And as of making this video, I asked everyone in the community tab here on YouTube if I should do a GoFundMe, something that I've kind of been hesitant about doing. If I do wind up doing it, I'll pin it in the comments below. I don't have to worry about tickets, as I already am marked down as media. This would just be to get me the rest of the way. We'll see how it all goes. Take care everyone and I hope you find yourselves a good table.